Today we start lecture 22 of 24. Uh, we'll be covering synchronization and non-deterministic behavior. Uh, we use non-determinism in general in self-time circuits to allow the, uh, the chip that we are building to make a decision, uh, to make a choice, uh, specifically about uh, if we are waiting two, for two events uh, and we want to pick the event that arrives first, uh, then we can do that. Now, this is a distinct advantage beyond synchronous circuits uh, because synchronous circuits uh, have the clock, which means that they have a bounded time in which they are allowed to wait for that decision to be made. And it turns out that uh, in general, uh, when making a choice based upon two continuous inputs, events can arrive uh, at times that are arbitrarily close to each other, right? And the closer and closer those two events uh, arrive uh, together, then the longer and longer it takes for uh, any system to make uh, a choice about which one came first. Uh, specifically, uh, if those two events arrive at the same time, then uh, it can take arbitrarily long for that decision to be made. Uh, and in particular, uh, there's no uh, there's no guarantees made about uh, kind of the distribution of choices that are made um, uh, regarding uh, those two events. So let's take a look at uh, the syntax. Right. So in CHP or HSC. Uh, you know, we have our conditional statements. Uh, and in particular, uh, we generally have a thick box uh, for our conditional statements. But for non-deterministic selection, we have a thin bar uh, or uh, in HSC sim and uh, the haystack tool set uh, that is replaced with a colon uh, because the thin bar uh, conflicts with the syntax for Boolean or in the guards. And so uh, this is the HSC for uh, a circuit that we call an arbiter. And it just, you know, given two inputs A and B, if A arrives first, then it raises you, uh, wait for waits for A to go low before lowering you again. If B arrives first, then it raises V, waits for B to go low again before lowering V. If they arrive at the same time, it'll choose between the two arbitrarily. Uh, it'll pick either A or B and then raise the associated uh, variable, either U or V. Now, it's, now this is an important uh, kind of subtle aspect of this. These are picked arbitrarily uh, and not randomly. This means that uh, A could always be preferred over B or B could always be preferred over A, right? The, um, the point at which uh, a decision is made one way or another uh, is not, uh, is we can't make any guarantees about that because of process variation, because of temperature differentials. Uh, these things basically uh, mean that uh, the, the boundary between A or B arriving first is variable. Okay. And so to implement this non-deterministic selection, uh, we can use a mutual exclusion element, uh, which is effectively just an end latch that we are driving in the opposite direction we normally drive it when we are storing uh, data, right? So uh, at the beginning, both A and B start low. This drives uh, both underscore U and underscore V high, right? Going through these NAND gates. Um, then, a, uh, if both A and B go high at the same time, uh, then either underscore U or underscore V will go low. In this case, we're, we're choosing underscore U. So that goes low first. Uh, and then we wait for A to be lowered uh, in response to getting access to some shared resource, uh, which then allows us to raise underscore U, unblocking underscore V. So that goes low next, uh, providing the shared resource over to B. Uh, B goes low uh, in response to uh, access the shared resource, and then uh, we, that raises underscore V again. And so uh, the production rules, which we can use to specify this, are shown over on the right here. Uh, and, uh, and those are basically just the normal production rules we, we see for a latch, 
plus an extra uh, kind of uh, statement uh, specification uh, saying that uh, underscore u and underscore v must be uh, made mutually exclusive low by the production rule simulator, uh, because otherwise um, the production rule simulator can't uh, uh, can't guarantee that since it is not a digital guarantee, it is an analog guarantee. So what happens then when both A and B actually arrive at the same time? Uh, on the right here, we have both A and B start low, and then at some time, T, they both go high. And underscore U and underscore V both start high, and then when A and B both go high, we see both underscore U and underscore V start to transition low. But then they reach uh, half VDD, and they hit a state called metastability, uh, in which uh, both, um, basically all of the transitions, all of the transistors uh, in both of these gates are kind of half on, and they're in a way fighting each other. And it can take arbitrarily long for this metastable state to resolve one way or another. Uh, and when it does, then uh, one of the signals, in this case, underscore U, trans continues to transition low, and the other signal transitions back high. Now, what this means is that we are effectively getting both weak interference inside this, uh, these two gates, and we're producing an instability on underscore V, which can then propagate out into the rest of the system. And so this violates both the guarantees that we need for uh, a, a quasi-delay insensitive circuit. Um, and we can draw a box around these two gates uh, and pretend that the kind of weak interference isn't happening as long as uh, we don't allow this instability to propagate out into the rest of the system, right? The other transition on underscore U is act is still monotonic, right? It's it's going from one to zero without ever going back to one, and so that's actually an okay transition. Uh, we can wait for that, but the transition that V is going through back to one is problematic, and so we need to add some kind of filter to prevent this from propagating out into the rest of the system. And that's where the metastability filter comes in. So we add two inverters to the end here, uh, and then we wire uh, underscore U to the VDD node of the, inver of the inverter driving V, and underscore V to the VDD node of the inverter driving U. And what this does is when we are in a metastable state, then these VDDs for the inverters will be 0 0.5. And the uh, transistors in the inverters, uh, the, specifically the PMOS transistors in both of these inverters, uh, will not be able to pass their threshold voltage uh, because VDD is 0 0.5, ground is 0, and the threshold is somewhere around, uh, it's generally between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5. Uh, and so, U and V are guaranteed to be low. Uh, and then once we exit the metastable state, uh, the, the one that wins the arbitration will transition high, in this case, U. Now, this is an analog circuit. This is not a digital circuit. Uh, these guarantees must be made uh, in layout uh, and based on threshold voltages uh, relative to uh, VDD. Uh, and based on uh, the transistor bias. And so uh, when designing a non-deterministic selection, uh, it is important that we uh, only uh, use this cell to implement non-deterministic non selection, and uh, we, we have to then, uh, for any uh, non-deterministic selection, project out the arbiter uh, so that we can use our very carefully crafted implementation and layout. So the production rules for uh, this arbiter are, are shown below, and we, we can see that we've added the uh, instability filter or metastability filter uh, to our production rule set. Uh, specifically, we have our inverter, not underscore u drives u high and underscore u drives u low uh, with the VDD node attached to underscore V. Now, uh, these are not the, the way that you would write the metastability uh, filter in ACT. Uh, 
Uh, in ACT, you have to create a new PRS body with underscore V set as the VDD node uh, uh, for the whole PRS body or underscore U set to the VDD node for the whole PRS body for V. Uh, and we'll see that in the examples. So this arbiter is called the buffered arbiter. Uh, so we have our uh, mutual exclusion element here, and we have uh, our uh, metastability filter here. And we represent this in, uh, in block diagrams with uh, you know, a box labeled A, uh, with two inputs, A and B, and two outputs, U and V. The internal nodes, underscore U and underscore V, are then hidden. Uh, but uh, this arbiter implementation actually has a uh, subtle problem, and that is uh, if we assume that you know uh, A and B both went high at the same time, and then at some point uh, U was chosen uh, by the arbiter, and so U went high and V remained low, then at some point A goes down, right, having uh, had access to its shared resource, and it no longer needs it. So it lowers A, lowers its request. Uh, and then as a result, um, the output uh, on, on U can start transitioning low. However, if the gate capacitance on U is particularly high, then that transition for U going low can be quite slow. In the meantime, there's a parallel path from underscore U back through the mutual exclusion element out into underscore V and then out through V. And that allows V to transition high in parallel with the downgoing transition on U. Uh, and if the gate capacitance on V is low, then the transition on V can be quite fast. And so there's a transient state in which V transitions high while U is still high, right? And this breaks our original specification where U and V were guaranteed to be mutually exclusive high, right? So in order to fix this, uh, then we need to add a, a further mutual exclusion element using a P latch this time uh, and combine it into the metastability filter. And so this uh, forces that parallel path to actually go through the, mutual, the second mutual exclusion element, keeping those transitions uh, uh, mutually exclusive. In effect, now the transition, uh, the upgoing transition on V is forced to wait for the downgoing transition on U to pass the threshold voltage. Now, this is uh, a very subtle thing. Generally, the gate capacitances on U and V are, uh, are not that different. And so uh, the probability that this is an issue is generally pretty low. Uh, but if you want to make a strictly quasi-delay insensitive circuit, then uh, this uh, fix uh, needs to be put in place in order to make that happen. Otherwise, you are effectively assuming fast inverters uh, on in the buffered arbiter case, which is not too much of a problem, but uh, you are making that assumption. And so uh, the production rules for this are shown to the right, and uh, we've added in uh, a weight on not v, and um, the uh, and we've ORed in v here to make a p latch, uh, and we still have underscore v set as the VDD node for this p latch, uh, and it's symmetric for v. So uh, once again, uh, when drawing block diagrams, we have a uh, an ideal arbiter, right? I a. Uh, it has two inputs a and b, and two outputs u and v. So now that we have this arbiter, uh, we can use it to try to implement uh, uh, arbitrary non-deterministic selection statements. Uh, in particular, if we uh, if we have a four-condition uh, non-deterministic selection statement, uh, then we're going to need to uh, create a four-input arbitration system. Uh, and we do this using a circuit called uh, a tree arbiter. Now, the tree arbiter has two inputs uh, that are channels, right, E1 of 1, uh, and A and B, representing uh, two of the uh, N uh, conditional statements, right, uh, uh, cases. And then it has one output, which is a request for a grant from the root node. And so 
uh, we get a request in from, let's say, A, uh, the tree arbiter propagates that request out to the root, uh, and then the root node re replies with a grant, which is then passed back on to A. And this grant is guaranteed to be uh, uh, on only passed on to one of these four channels at a time. So the CHP for describing one of these tree arbiters uh, is shown to the left here. So we have a probe on A and a probe on B, right, in two different conditions, uh, separated by a non-deterministic selection. So if A arrives first, then we make a request out for the grant from the root node, uh, uh, and that is composed uh, no slack sequential with the uh, with the completion of the uh, communication action with A. So in effect, uh, we only uh, complete the communication action on A when we have a grant uh, to use for that completion. Now, probing a channel A or B doesn't actually have an effect on the channel. And so uh, this, the thing that is keeping these mutually exclusive is this non-deterministic selection statement. It has nothing to do with the, uh, the composition operators between S and A and S and B. So we've gone over no slack sequential composition uh, before in previous lectures. Uh, and so I'm gonna show it uh, here again. We start by raising the request for the grant from the root node. We wait for the grant uh, on s.e. Then once we have the grant, we can compute, we can complete the entire communication action on A before lowering our request for the grant and waiting for the grant to be released. In order to uh, synthesize this tree arbiter circuit, uh, we first need to uh, project the arbiter out, right? We're going to be following uh, the formal synthesis procedure to uh, construct this tree arbiter. And so the first step is projecting this non-deterministic selection statement out into an arbiter. And we do this as follows, right? The uh, the non-deterministic selection statement is shown uh, first, right? So then we wait on A, and then we uh, we execute uh, communication actions on U and A uh, in a no slack sequential composition. Uh, and then we wait. Uh, we can also wait for the the request on B and execute the communication actions on V and B in a no slack sequential composition. So effectively, this is the same specification as our arbiter that we have just that we had just previously designed what's left is uh, roughly the same specification for our tree arbiter uh, with s and u and s and v however because u and v are now guaranteed by our arbiter to be mutually exclusive we no longer have to make that guarantee in our selection statement here right uh, we can now use the thick bar uh, rather than the thin bar, right? This is a uh, deterministic selection, right? And that's the primary difference, is that we've effectively projected out the non-deterministic selection. So this is the ideal arbiter that we've previously implemented, and uh, except that it is connected up, uh, as you would expect, a, a couple of channels. And so the request on A and the request on B are made mutually exclusive by the arbiter uh, in order to generate the request on U and V, and then uh, whenever there's a request on U or V, that enable goes straight back through to uh, A or B. And so now all that's left is to synthesize uh, this process specification for our tree arbiter. And the first step in that is to expand our HSC. And so uh, this is just the no slack sequential composition operator that we showed previously, right? Wait for the, or uh, make a request for the root node uh, and then wait for the grant, execute our entire communication action on you, uh, lower the request for the root node and then wait for the grant to be released. And it's symmetric for V as well. Uh, and the probes in this case on U and V uh, simply turn into a wait 
a guard on the request for U or V. The next step in our formal synthesis procedure is to do handshake reshuffling. Uh, and so if we look at this handshake, we can see that um, these two guards are not necessary, right? Uh, you, we already wait for U.R for this branch, uh, and we already wait for V.R for this branch. And so those two are already guaranteed to be high, so we can remove them. Further, we can simplify this handshake a little by moving u.e high and v.e high uh, down uh, the specification a bit uh, to the end, right? Uh, so uh, effectively, because uh, the processes on the u and v channels are not communicating with the uh, process, uh, the, the processes representing the rest of the non-deterministic selection tree, um, and they're only communicating with this leaf process, then we, then any delay on uh, u.e or v.e is fine. Um, and they won't be able to uh, tell the difference between uh, u.e or v.e going high before uh, lowering the root request or after. And so we can move these two to the end. And so doing those two transformations gives us this HSC. We've removed the two guards and we've moved u.e and v.e to the end. And so now uh, we need to uh, deconflict the uh, state space by inserting state variable transitions. All right, so uh, we have two problems. First, s.r cannot use information about u.r or v.e uh, because that would not be CMOS implementable. And then s.r dot r here, um, the downgoing transition of s.r cannot use the information about u.r or u.e here because that wouldn't be CMOS implementable. So we need to implement, we need to add two state variable transitions, x and y. Um, and so when u.r is high and we've selected it, then we lower x first, then raise s.r, and then when uh, u dot r goes low, we raise x and lower s dot r. And it's symmetric for v as well, and y. So now we can start working through the uh, production rules for this HSC, uh, starting with x down. And so if we look at x down, uh, x down can, can go low when u dot r uh, is high. And we know that we have completed the other, whatever computation uh, we were doing on the other branch um, for v.e, right? And so if v.e is high and u.r is high, x can go low. It's symmetric for y, except we're looking at u.e and v.r. Uh, and then we look at s.r, and because we know uh, x down and y down are mutually exclusive, we can uh, or those two together. And so if either of those go low, then s.r goes high. Then we look at u.e. Uh, if s.e goes low, signifying that we have raised the request for s.r and we now have the grant, uh, and x is low, signifying that we are in the branch for u, then we can pass that grant back on to our, uh, our input uh, on u. Right? And same thing for v. Uh, then we need to look at the uh, production rules for x. So if u.r goes low, then it signifies that we have acknowledged the downgoing transition on u.e, uh, and uh, same thing for y. Then for s.r, uh, we have to wait for both of these to be high uh, before lowering s.r, because uh, we could be in either of these two branches, and we don't know which. Finally, uh, we just need to wait for s.e to go high before raising u.e and s.e to go high before raising v.e. Okay, so this is a valid production rule set. However, we have two C elements on x and y, uh, which could be problematic. And so we, we actually want to add some state holding information in x up and y up uh, so that we can use combinational gates instead of uh, state holding gates, right, uh, C elements. And so uh, in specifically, if we look at the downgoing rule of x, we see we have v.e and u.r. 
And the combinational rule on the other side would be not v dot e or not u to r. Now, if we look at v dot e and, and x, x is only low for this section of the handshake. And v dot e is only low for this section of the handshake. And so uh, any time that v is low, x will already be high, which means that uh, if we add in those combinational rules, then um, anytime V is low, it will only cause vacuous transitions on X, and it won't affect the rest of the handshake. Uh, in this, uh, effectively, what we have is we have the uh, the active transition, right? The the guard, the piece of the guard driving the active transition on the uh, outgoing variable. And then we have the piece of the guard driving the state holding uh, part of the uh, variable. OK, so this is our production rule set for the tree arbiter. We can then take our uh, arbiter that we factored out uh, and add it back in, uh, You know, combining renaming nodes to match the uh, internal node uh, names. And uh, this is this implements our full tree arbiter spec. Let's get into some examples. So in lecture twenty two, uh, we have two examples, e one and e two. In e one, uh, we are uh, instantiating an ideal arbiter which is defined in sync.act. Now, sync.act has two arbiter definitions, one which is the buffered arbiter, right, exclusive high, uh, and one which is the ideal arbiter, uh, exclusive high ideal. And we'll be implementing both of those. Uh, then if we look at e1.rc, uh, this works through uh, several different cases, uh, setting A or B high uh, at different intervals to try to drive different uh, cases, you know, behavioral cases within the arbiter. And so we'll be able to look at that in the uh, analog simulation. So let's implement, uh, let's take a look at uh, our uh, arbiter implementation. So let's start with the buff buffered arbiter. We first need the uh, spec statement uh, forcing underscore u and underscore v mutually exclusive low. And so that would be mk exclo l o right make exclusive low uh, underscore u underscore v right and then we need to implement the the latch uh, between a b underscore u and underscore v and so if a is high and underscore v is high meaning we haven't already chosen underscore v then we can drive underscore u low if B is high and underscore U is high, meaning we haven't already chosen underscore U, then we can drive underscore V low. And then we have the opposing combinational rule. So not A or not underscore B drives underscore U high, and not B or not underscore U drives underscore V high. OK, that's our mutex element. Then we need to implement the metastability filter. And so we have two production rule bodies uh, here and here, and we've already set underscore V as the VDD node for this production rule set and underscore U as the VDD node for this production rule set. So we just now need to implement the inverters for the metastability filter. And so this would be underscore U drives U down, not underscore U drives U up. And now this is distinctly different from uh, what we had on the slide, which was uh, uh, at underscore V and not underscore U drives U up. Right, this at underscore v is being taken care of by setting the underscore v node here as the VDD node. Okay, and so we can do the same thing down here. So underscore v drives v down, not underscore v drives v up. So that is our uh, buffered arbiter. Let's uh, let's copy this over to the ideal arbiter and make the necessary modifications. So now we need to modify this buffered arbiter to implement the ideal arbiter. Uh, and specifically, we need to make sure that before raising u, uh, we guarantee that v is low. Uh, and then we need the combinational rule on the other side. So v or, 
And then before raising V, we need to make sure that U is low. And then we need the combinational on the other side, so U or. And so that is our ideal arbiter. Okay, now that we've implemented the R, let's uh, call make E1. Uh, actually, let me uh, go into the broccoli command line interface. Uh, make E1. Here we go. So we have E1.prs, uh, and it has all of our production rules. And notice that it has the make exclusive low statement here. So we can run this through PRSim. PRSim E1.prs source e1.rc right and so it's working through uh, a whole bunch of different scenarios here and the digital simulation in this case is not particularly helpful uh, because we want to see uh, the analog behavior of this uh, buffered arbiter so let's go into the analog uh, simulation directory e1 and let's uh, call pearsim env.prs source pearsim.rc it boots up and runs. Okay, PR view test.spy .prn. Okay, so here's our analog simulation. We have A and we have B, and you can see that uh, first A goes high, then B, then A and B go high, close to each other, and then closer, and then closer, and then closer, right? And so we're trying to cause that metastability uh, condition. Uh, so then we have our internal nodes, underscore U and underscore V. Uh, and uh, then we have our output nodes, U and V. So let's zoom in here and take a look at each one of these cases. Uh, so in case one, uh, A arrives first uh, quite clearly. And so underscore U goes low and, and U goes high underscore and, and underscore V and, under, and V are not, uh, are left unaffected, All right? Then A goes low, uh, underscore U goes high, U goes low. Here we have B goes high, so underscore V goes low and V goes high. And then on the other side of that, uh, B goes low, uh, underscore V goes high and V goes low. Okay, now what happens if they start arriving closer? Then you'll notice that we start getting this bump uh, in, in underscore V, right? And that bump doesn't show up uh, in the output output for V. And so, you know, A is still arriving uh, uh, first quite clearly. And so underscore U goes low first uh, and U goes high. But if we start pushing this boundary, right, we get a little bit closer and we can see that bump start to grow in size. And then we get a little bit closer and the bump grows even further. And then we get a little bit closer and there we hit our metastability condition. And so we can clearly see both A and B go high at the same time. Both underscore U and underscore V transition to half VDD. We hit a metastable state and uh, underscore V in this case loses and underscore U wins the metastable uh, uh, state, right? And so uh, on, the, on our outputs, we see V remains stable and U transitions high after resolving that metastability, signifying that U has, has won the metastable state. OK, so let's take a look at example two. So our goal is to implement a tree arbiter. Uh, now that we have the arbiter in sync.act, we want to implement our tree arbiter. And so we have a source and a sync defined here, uh, and they're driving two channels, A and B, and we have a sync on S. Uh, and so that drives our tree arbiter with A, B, and S. And effectively, we're keeping the enables on A and B mutually exclusive. OK, so let's uh, start with our production rule body, PRS, g.vdd, g.gnd. And we're just going to go back to the lecture since we spent a lot of time doing 
uh, formal synthesis, we're going to go back to the lecture and copy these production rules over. Okay. So uh, we need to create definitions for U, V, X, and Y. U, V, X, Y. Uh, and then we have C elements uh, on A.E and B.E. And so we need to create the internal nodes for those C elements and create reset states. And so we, we're going to create uh, definitions for underscore AE and underscore BE. So those are driven pi first. Underscore PE up. And then low uh, on the on the other side. So underscore a e down, and that drives a e up, and underscore b e down, and that drives b e up. Okay. Now let's handle reset. Uh, in general, we want uh, both of our uh, input enables to be high, signifying that there is no grant out to them. And so let's uh, set g dot reset or, and then g dot reset or, and we'll use s reset, and then not g dot s reset and, and not g dot s reset and. Okay, uh, the rest of these gates are combinational, and so we don't need to uh, spend time resetting them. We have one more piece, and that is uh, the ideal arbiter, and so let's uh let's pull our I ideal arbiter from sync.act so we have e exclusive high ideal uh, we're going to give it globals and then we're going to give it um the request on a the request on b and then the request on b and then we're going to give it uh u and v uh, and we need to give it a name so let, let's just call this arb uh, and so we've we've instantiated our ideal arbiter. Okay, let's see if this works. So uh, make e two. Uh, we need to take a look at our channel dot act definition. Ah, we have uh, e one of n. So we need to rather than using dot r, we need to use dot d. This is dot d zero. Dot D0, dot D0, and dot D0. E2, all right. Here's some E2 dot PRS, source E2 dot RC. All right, uh, no instabilities, uh, no interference. Uh, it looks like it is operating correctly. So let's check our analog simulation. PRSIM, env.prs, source prsim.rc, and then cycle. Uh, we can just advance. Okay. PR view test.spy.prn. Let's put in our two requests on A and B. A, B. Our two enables on A and B. Now, our enables need to be, we are trying to guarantee that they are mutually exclusive low. Uh, and then we have our request on the root node, S and our enable on the root node, SE. Okay, let's zoom in a bit and see what's going on. So keep in mind that this is random timing. Uh, and we have requests on A and B, right? And we are, uh, so this is reset at the moment, then we get past reset and we start here. Okay, so let's zoom in, what's going on? 
So we can see uh, the requests for both A and B are high at the same time, uh, but our arbiter is keeping the uh, enables mutually exclusive low. So we we first lower BE and then we lower AE after uh, after we have handled BE. Uh, and we can see on the root node side, uh, we have a request for a grant. We get the grant. Uh, we then return the grant uh, by lowering uh, by lowering the request, and then uh, make another request for the grant by raising the request, uh, and then we get a new grant. And that all happens fairly quickly. Uh, and then the request on A uh, is uh, goes low, and the request on B is high, and so the enable on uh, on A goes high. Uh, then we are waiting for the grant from our root node. When we receive the grant from our root node, we lower the enable, signifying we pass the grant back to B. And so we can, you know, we this actually functions properly if we if we zoom out a bit. We can see that in general, uh, the enables for A and B are uh, mutually exclusive. So if we remove this panel, right? Uh, they're not low at the, ever at the same time. They trade off with each other. And so that's it. Uh, we are now implementing non-deterministic selection uh, between any number of uh, channels.